Hey, welcome back to Cool Classics. Today we're going to take a look at the life and career of Barbara Eden. I found some really cool clips, some good stories. One of her best friends in the whole world was Dawn Wells. That's right, Marianne on Gilligan's Island. Let's get into this. Here we go. She was born Barbara Jean Moorhead, August 23rd, 1931 in Tucson, Arizona. You'll notice that some places list her as being born in 1934, but Barbara freely admits she shaved three years off of her age just so that she could make sure that she was hired for parts because they were always hiring younger women. Her mother, Alice Mary, and her father, Hubert Henry Moorhead, divorced while she was still really little. Now, she moved with her mother to San Francisco, and after a few years, her mother remarried, this time Harrison Connor Huffman, and the two of them had a daughter, which would be Barbara's half-sister. Now, he took care of her and raised her, so she took his last name. And In some of these early appearances on television, you'll notice in the credits, she's named as Barbara Huffman. The Great Depression deeply affected their family. They really couldn't afford very many luxuries. So their mother Alice would entertain the children with singing in the evenings. And this developed to where both daughters wanted to sing more and more. And they got really good. Barbara was in the um, church choir and she sang all of the solos. And then as a teenager, she was so good that local bands would pay her $10 to come out and sing all these cover songs for them in nightclubs. And she would do that multiple nights a week to earn money. By the time she was 16, Barbara wanted to sing and act and do it all. She was already a member of the Actors Equity, and she started studying singing at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, along with acting classes with Elizabeth Holloway School of Theater. She ended up graduating from Abraham Lincoln High School in San Francisco in the spring of 1949. Then she went on to study theater for one year at City College of San Francisco. In 1951, she entered the Miss San Francisco pageant and ended up winning it all. Now, this entered her into the Miss California pageant, which she placed really high in, but she didn't win. After that, she set her sights on acting. Now, of course, it was hard for her to find work at first. It took her until 1955 before she landed her first uncredited role. Then in 1956, a couple more. But then in 1957, she got to be on I Love Lucy, episode Country Club Dance. Check this out. Listen, where is your house guest? You'll be right along. Oh, here we are, Diana. Hi. <laughs> Diana Jordan. This is Mr. and Mrs. Ralph Ramsey. How do you do? Hello. This is Ricky Ricardo. Hello. How do you do? And I'm Freddie Mertz. <laughs> now, oh, but yes. It's all right, fellas. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, now, wait a minute. My mother told me to pick you. Uh. <laughs> Oh, you know Lucy won't put up with that. Now that could be considered her big break because her whole career jump started right then. That appearance was early in 1957 and right afterward she landed spots on 10 more TV series of the time like The Millionaire, Highway Patrol, Crossroads, Perry Mason, Gunsmoke, Bachelor Father, December Bride, it just goes on and on. But then at the very end of 1957, she landed a reoccurring role on How to Marry a Millionaire. Barbara said that she was asked to audition for the role of Loco Jones because one of the casting directors seen her on the I Love Lucy episode and thought she'd be a perfect fit. This called for someone to play a character that was like a Marilyn Monroe. And she said, there was no room to bring any of your own personality in there. It was already developed and you had to deliver. And she said, I guess I did a really good job. They hired me and then the show went on from 1957 to 1959. She appeared in 52 episodes because they saw her on I Love Lucy. Oh, I never realized how many wealthy men there are in this country. Look at that, $4 million? Yeah. $2 million? 
million? Well, Captain Wesley just discovered this uranium mine worth zillions, see, and he... Oh, he isn't a real person. I sure wish one of them would come along before he has to whisper sweet nothings into my ear trumpet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm beginning to think millionaires don't like girls. Honey, if they didn't, there wouldn't be any John D. Rockefeller, a junior. <laughs> like your friend Logo, that Eddie, always talking about his yacht. Did you ever see it? Sure. One night he let me row it across the lake in Central Park. <laughs> That's what I mean. What a freaky scene. I'd never heard of that show before. I just watched three episodes in a row, all because Barbara Eden was in it. And now I think I like it. Now, during that time, she met and fell in love with Michael and Sarah, fellow actor, and the two of them got married. <laughs> yep. You know who he was? He was Cochise on the TV series Broken Arrow. He was Kane in Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, and he was Commander Kang in three episodes of Star Trek. I must confess to a certain admiration for you. I know, of course, that it was you who destroyed our supplies last night. You of the Federation, you are much like us. We're nothing like you. I mean that we are similar as a species. Here we are on a planet of sheep. Two tigers, killers. The two of them were a happy Hollywood couple and they were both getting a lot of work on television. But at the same time, Barbara was starting to receive movie roles. And in 1960, she got to be in a movie with Elvis Presley. I mean, you don't get much bigger than that. She co-starred in the movie Flaming Star. Barbara Eaton, the beauty who fired the conflict in Pacer's soul. You were the worst. You made me feel it the worst. Dude, Elvis was the man. He had Barbara Eden co-starring. He had Donna Douglas in a movie. Check out my Donna Douglas video. You'll really like it. Now, she was still appearing on all the television shows of the time. The Virginian, Rawhide, Burke's Law, Route 66. Heck, check this one out. She was on Andy Griffith. Hey, will you look what's getting off that bus? Ring and ding and ding. <laughs> She's what I call a female. She's coming right in here. <laughs> I'm looking for the proprietor. I better check and see if there's been any crime waves or anything. <laughs> well, well, goodbye, Floyd. And that's why I love Don Knotts. I made a video on him, too. Now, in 1964, she made a movie with Tony Randall and Burl Ives called The Brass Bottle. This wasn't a big hit, but it turned out to be another big break for her. In the movie, she plays the fiancé of Tony Randall, who finds this bottle with a magic genie inside, <laughs> played by Burl Ives. And that's pretty much all I need to tell you, because you're thinking already, hey, this sounds kind of familiar. Oriental feast to your guests. A luscious, seductive, tantalizing dancing girl to your fiancé. I didn't do this. He did. Who did? I can't tell you. So the story goes like this. In 1964, ABC came out with the TV show Bewitched. It climbed all the way to number two in the ratings. NBC was looking for a show to compete against it. And that's when producer Sidney Sheldon came in and pitched them the idea of a female genie that was trapped in a bottle and she comes out and, you know, antics ensue. They told him they would give him 13 episodes, go find his cast. Now he says he was inspired by watching The Brass Bottle and thought, wow, what if it would have been a female genie? They missed their chance there. And so he was going to run with this idea. And he auditioned lots of women for the part, but he was looking for a brunette because Samantha on Bewitched was blonde and he thought that would just be too much. Now, after about a month of not finding the right female lead, he started thinking about maybe I should give that lady that was in the <laughs> brass bottle a call. And he called her agent. She came in and auditioned and he thought, well, forget about not having a blonde. We need her. And what a smart decision that was. You replace Barbara as Jeannie, and I don't think you have a hit. Actually, they didn't think they had a hit. They were going up against the big show, number two in the ratings. 
and they were only going to put out 13 episodes and just see what happens. And right off the bat, they ran into a little situation. Just a couple episodes in, and they found out Barbara was pregnant. Yep, and how are we going to work around this? Because she's just going to look more and more pregnant as we go. So they hurried up and filmed the rest of their 10 episodes really quick. And they still had to do a little bit of creativity with the outfit to try and hide a little bit of the baby bump, but they filmed them all really fast. They were in such a rush to get this out there, they didn't even create a theme song for the first season. But once the ratings came in and they saw they had something good going on, they wanted to come back for another year, and everybody signed on. Barbara Eden, Larry Hagman, Bill Daly, everyone was excited. And Barbara was really excited. She just had a baby boy. I ask you not to tell Jeannie. Well, what did she do to you? <sighs> what did she do to me? She helped me. That's what she did. How are you feeling, Master? I want my 2020 vision back. <laughs> Can't you fix him up? Well, I must say it is rather nice to have him like this. This way he cannot look at other girls. Jeannie, please! Yes, Master, 2020 vision. <laughs> Well, I'm working on your 2020 vision, Master. It is not easy. Are you feeling better, Master? Is that better, Master? Can you see me now, Tony? Uh, you know I always use the freakiest clips that I could find. Now, the show was a hit, and it went on for five seasons. 139 episodes. Barbara appeared in every one of them. It's a classic. I still love it. And now, afterward, from the early 70s through 1981, she had a hard time finding work. Not even guest appearances on other TV shows. She was really kind of just only on TV movies. And, you know, even that started to dry up. But then in 1981, she got on Harper Valley PTA, the TV series. She appeared in 30 episodes playing Stella Johnson. Barbara said that she was definitely typecast, but there was also this disowning of anyone who had been on a TV show from the 60s to the mid-70s. They just kind of wrote you off. If you came in for an audition and they found out like you were on I Dream of Jeannie, they would just say, thank you, we'll call you. And they, sometimes they'd just say, thank you, we're not interested, and you wouldn't even get an audition. It was like you were the plague almost. And you know you had to persevere and continue to go on. Her co-star, Larry Hagman from I Dream of Jeannie, said that he fell into this too. It took him forever, but eventually he got on the TV show Dallas and became the best character on there. And he had some executive power at one point, and he brought in Barbara Eden. She played Leanne De La Vega. Oh, what are you doing here? I was about to order lunch. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, well, this is my table. I was told this was reserved for Ewing Oil, so naturally I sat here. Please, sit down. Yeah, very generous of you. And what did you find so amusing about last night? Just trying to tell the players without a scorecard, for one thing. Uh, now let's see, the young man you sent home before the fireworks is your son by your first wife, is that correct? And uh, the little blonde girl, your ex-wife, is carrying your child. And the handsome young man she was with is your son by the woman you just became engaged to. Man, that Dallas show was something else. <laughs> Now, Barbara said that over time, a real camaraderie grew between all of the actors of the 60s and 70s that were typecast and outcast. So whenever one of them would get a second chance or make it again, they would always bring somebody with them. And this was something that was, you know, reoccurring. Like Larry just did it, bringing Barbara in on Dallas. And Andy Griffith did it when he got Matlock. He went and got Don Knotts to appear on there. And this was something that, you know, it, it changed. Like at one point, Bewitched and I Dream of Jeannie were head to head, but now all the cast members are they're all in the same boat, along with Gilligan's Island, the Munsters, Adam's family, the boat that nobody wants. So they all stuck together and got a real bond. As a matter of fact, 
Don Wells and Barbara Eden became really great friends over the years. They did hundreds of events together. Barbara says that Don Wells was a sweetheart of a person, and the two of them clicking was just a natural progression after doing all these autograph and meet and greet sessions over the years. At one point, there was a slowdown in events that would hire them to do personal appearances, and that's when they realized if they offered themselves as a package deal, they could still find steady work, and they were relying on this for income. She says it worked out perfectly. They were best friends. They got to travel around the country meeting their fans together. The fans enjoyed them both and were fans of each other's shows. Just everything was right. When Don Wells passed away, Barbara left a statement that just breaks your heart. You could tell she was devastated. Now, her marriage to Michael and Sarah ended in 1974. Then she married Charles Fagert in 1977, and that ended in 1982. Then she married John Eichholz in 1991, and the two of them are happily married and still together. Now, her son, Matthew and Sarah, passed away at the age of 35, and that was probably the hardest thing she ever had to deal with. She mentioned it on a talk show one time, and she broke down crying. Now for my favorite part of this video. As of June 2021, Barbara Eden is still alive and doing good. And if you've ever met her anywhere, leave a comment down below. Let me know, was Dawn Wells there? <laughs> Give this video a thumbs up. Think about subscribing. I put a lot of effort into my videos. I have them on Tina Louise, Dawn Wells, Donna Douglas, many more. I love it. These are my people. Cool classics.